Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Love, Marriage, and Finances with your host, Sid Misra, Certified Financial Planner. Thank you so much for tuning in. I am passionate about financial education and helping people make better money decisions. And in my series, Love, Marriage, and Finances, I want to help couples have the important money conversations so that they can go into their marriage and their partnership stronger. In this episode of Love, Marriage, and Finances, we're going to dive into how couples actually merge their finances, from income and expenses to credit cards, work benefits, and so much more. Stay tuned because this is an episode you don't want to miss. Thank you. Let's first start by looking at your finances through the lens of time. You see, how we handle money is going to change as life happens and life evolves. Whether it's having kids or dealing with deaths in the family, dealing with a job gain or loss, or coming into money through inheritance or some other means. What works for you and your partner early on in the relationship may not be something that works for you both later on as life progresses. It's really important to understand this. The key to success is being flexible and being able to adjust as life happens. So the lens of time. Now let's talk about expectations and responsibilities within the couple and within the partnership. What financial expectations do we have about the relationship and how things are going to work? You'd be surprised at how many couples don't have these conversations and come into money conflicts because they haven't done the work ahead of time. So the first thing we wanna ask ourselves is who's gonna manage the finances? And ideally, this answer includes both of you, both partners working on and handling the finances together so that you're both on the same page and you both understand what's going on. Doing it as a team makes it easier and makes it easier for you both to understand. Now, this may not always be the case in relationships and you may have a situation where one partner feels more comfortable with money, feels more comfortable managing it, and takes the lead in the relationship. That doesn't mean that the other partner just sits back and lets them do whatever they need to and doesn't have a hand in how things are managed or has an understanding of the processes going on behind the scenes. This other partner needs to be involved and needs to make sure that they're asking questions and they're staying up to date on what's going on with the family finances. What decisions are being made and why are they being made? Why are we doing the things that we're doing? Now, when we move on to the next level, it's income, right? How much money is coming into the household and how are we managing that? You need to ask the following questions when you're considering combining finances and combining your income together. Are we going to be a single income or a dual income household? You may be in a relationship right now where both partners are working. And again, going back to a previous point, that may not always be the case. So have a discussion about this going into the relationship so you have an understanding before life happens. So if we have kids, what are the expectations about our finances around having kids? Will one of us be a stay-at-home parent the entire time that they're in school? and not just during paternity or maternity leave, right? That's a longer time frame that you may be on one income and the household may have to tighten up their grip on some of the expenditures going forward. And think about how you're gonna manage on that one income. Is it feasible for you guys to spend money on housing, whether it's rent or your mortgage and the other day-to-day -day expenses and things that you need to survive? Can you do that on one income? And if not, how much of a gap is there? And does the other partner have to reconsider being a stay-at-home parent and going back into the workforce? Part of that income talk is also managing expenses, right? Expenses are where the money is going. What are we spending money on? And does this align with our values and what we want to see happen with our lives? When you're combining finances, it's a great idea to look at expenses and see if there's any overlap. Are there things that you're both spending money on that one of you can cut out and you can only have you know, one account on that? Are there ways to be more efficient and cut out the excesses? So for example, if you're both paying memberships to certain subscription services, maybe one person cancels it and both of you can use that service. Is there an overlap? Are there things that we can consolidate? Netflix, Spotify, Amazon Prime accounts, for example, right? Those things don't seem like big expenses, but they do add up and it does mean extra money that could be going towards your goals. And the other expenses that go into merging finances and merging your lives, living expenses, for example. When we talk about spending, we also want to talk about the future. 
right? What are the big purchases that we both understand we want to make and how are we going to handle those? So the biggest one is usually buying a home uh, for people who want to get married, want to have that partnership and want to have a bigger place to live and also raise a family. So buying a home is a big one. Talk about that expenditure, talk about how much you think that's going to cost, realistically how much you can save up to afford that expenditure and what the time frame is on making that purchase. And again, you're laying the foundation for these money conversations around expenses, especially the major ones, right? How do we decide on what's affordable and what's not? What is the proper time frame for this decision? And are there other ways to go about financing this or are there other things that we can do as a substitute to this expense. To that point, there is a big difference between being able to make the payment and actually being able to afford something. And both of you need to be on the same page about this. It's one thing to just be able to make a payment, but if you can't afford to fund other parts of your life, your retirement, your you know day-to-day -day activities, because one payment is taking up so much of your income, you can't afford that. And that is something that both partners need to understand and be on the same page about. Now, hopefully when you're combining your finances, your income is at a good level, your ex expenditures and spending is at a lower level and you're banking the difference, right? You are spending less than you make and there is a surplus at the end of every month or at the end of the year. And one of the biggest things that you can do with that surplus is start putting it away for your future self. What are we doing as a couple to take care of our future selves and the goals that we've set as a couple? So saving and investing, short term, I want you to look at setting up an emergency fund, a cash reserve that has enough cash to cover between six and 12 months of expenses. Do you have that set up? Do you have enough cash flow to build that up? And once you've done that, where are you housing that money? Is it just in a regular bank account getting less than half a percent in interest or is it in a high yield savings to generate some sort of interest and return? The big thing with that is make sure it's liquid, make sure it's available because life happens, you know, things with your house, things with your car. If you have kids, things with your kids, they break, they break stuff. And so we need money to be able to pay off those expenses. And it's important to have that as your short term fund. And long term, what are we doing about funding our future nest egg? Eventually, both of us want to stop working and we need money to support our lifestyle in retirement. How much money are we putting away and how are we putting it away? Are we investing in ways that are going to generate more money in the future for us to use in our nest egg? My big advice to couples and to individuals as well, and I do this in my own finances, is to invest first, save and invest and put money aside first, and then spend what is left over. It's obviously much easier said than done, but this type of system allows you to think about your future self and fund those future goals and then also spend the remainder without having guilt because you know you've taken care of the important stuff beforehand. One more note on expenditures and saving and investing. It is much easier to spend less than you make and invest the difference and put it to work and maintain the same level of lifestyle throughout life and then into retirement. For the people that don't spend less than they make and they are spending more or just about as much as they make and not really saving, they are going to have to make a big lifestyle change eventually at some point. And that's going to be a tough conversation for both partners or that individual themselves. So to me, it's much easier to set that expectation going forward that we're going to manage our lifestyle right now. And then we can maintain that hopefully into retirement and beyond. So we've talked about income, spending, and then also saving the excess. And a big driver of this is your work and your employment. And the next thing we want to discuss is our work benefits. What work benefits are available to us and to us as a couple, right? One of you may have access to a really good retirement plan with the company match. The other may not. So can we take advantage of that? Or if both of you have that, can we both take advantage of that? What about health insurance? One partner may have really great coverage with their company's health plan. It may make sense for the other partner to join them in that company's plan and be on their partner's health care. These are the conversations that are important because you're, you're figuring out how to take advantage of the work benefits and how to set yourself up for success. Picking good health care, picking good retirement benefits is going to be key to long-term success. 
So look at work benefits, look at the retirement benefits, look at the healthcare benefits and the other benefits that are there. Are there things that one partner has that the other partner doesn't? And think about it in the context of your family now and in the future if you plan on having kids and adding more family members. What do these benefits look like if we have more members to the family? So what we just discussed is important and those conversations need to happen, but at a certain point we do need to actually merge finances together actually combine our money and start doing things as partners and not as individuals. So how do we put this into practice? Well, I think the easiest thing to start with is the joint expenses that you have. If you both go out to dinner, if you both have shared expenses in terms of rents or, or mortgage or property, things like that, the day-to-day -day expenses that it takes for people to live their lives, it would be a great idea to share those expenses to have that be paid out from a single account. And so a joint bank account is a great way to start the process of merging your finances together with your partner. Again, you can use this to pay your joint bills, manage expenses together, and have an understanding of how money is flowing. And in this account, you're both gonna be joint owners together. So you both have access to the money that's in the account. You both have access to add money to the account to pay off those expenses. To me, this is a great first step because you're building trust. Again, you both have access to it. So one partner could just take the money if they wanted to and, and run. But again, this is building up trust. This is building up a familiarity and comfortability with sharing finances together with your partner and doing things together as opposed to separate. And when we talk about the joint bank account, one of the questions we get is, you know, how much should we be contributing to this joint account if we both have our own individual jobs? And that's a great question. There's a couple of different ways to look at it. On the extremes, the one extreme is, you know, having all of your money go into this joint account and both partners, all of their money, all of their income going into it. It may not be the best idea if you're maybe a little bit older, you're coming in with assets and resources. Maybe you don't want to initially put all of your money together. And so another option is to look at the expenses and just split everything down the middle and say, okay, we had $2,000 worth of expenses this last month. I owe a thousand, you owe a thousand. And I'm going to deposit that into the account. You're going to deposit that into the account. And in that way we have the money to pay our expenses. And so we still have separate money outside. I still have my own bank account. You still have your own bank account. But in the shared one, we are pooling our resources just for the shared expenses. That is one way of doing it. And a lot of couples actually find this as a great way to start into the relationship and kind of dip their toes into merging finances. But what if one partner earns significantly more than the other? It makes it a little bit more difficult to just do a 50-50 split then that's where you can adjust and do maybe a percentage split. So if one partner makes more, maybe they cover a higher percentage of the expenses because their income allows them to do that. The same partner with their other income is also contributing a percentage and it's also fair because it's proportional to their income. So this is another way to look at how we're going to fund these accounts and how much money is going to be going into the shared pot. A great example of how things may change over time. Both partners at the beginning of a relationship may be earning the same, and then one partner may be earning a lot more later on due to you know, big job changes and big job growth. And so it may be time at that point to revisit how finances are done and how the partners are contributing to the shared pot. And real quick, when we talk about what banks to use, this is a conversation that you both need to have. What kind of bank are you looking for? What kind of bank do we want to use? Does it have access to a wide ATM network so that we can withdraw money without having service charges? Are there access to ATMs overseas if we would like to travel? Does it allow for a mobile app, right? Ease of use. Everybody does everything on their phones right now. And so does this bank allow for mobile banking and, and just ease of banking? And are there any transfer limits, things like that, that we want to figure out? So make sure you're having these conversations to figure out what kind of specific bank you're looking for as well. The next level of this from bank account is now credit card, right? If you have these joint expenses, a credit card may be a great opportunity to have, to have a joint way of paying for things that also gives you a benefit. Now, before we get into how to utilize the credit cards, I want to remind you that a credit card is simply a tool a tool for making purchases 
And that tool can be used for good. It can help you build up credit, and help you buy things without having to use cash. And there are advantages to it, cash back and points, but it can also be a tool for destruction if it's misused and if it's not used responsibly. So this is another conversation that you wanna have with your partner about using the credit card, being responsible about the charges that we're incurring on this card and what's actually going on it, how we're using it, how we're paying it off, all of those conversations. So for a credit card, there's gonna be one primary user which uses their social security number and their credit score and their credit report to open the card and then they can name an authorized user. And again, this is a level of trust that needs to be talked about and discussed with your partner. If one person's credit history and score is tied to this and you're giving access to somebody else, that is a level of trust there. You have to trust that person that they're not gonna misuse the card and make big purchases and expenditures because it's going to affect the primary owner's credit score negatively if those things are not paid off. So again, there's a level of trust to this that hopefully is building as you have these conversations and as you go through the steps. So how do you pick what credit card is gonna be best for you? You wanna figure out what's gonna complement your life. And again, this is a conversation that may change as life changes. I'll give you the example. Right now, my fiance and I have a credit card that is geared towards travel. So all of our joint purchases go on the card, we pay it off, we get points. And we can use those points for airline uh, purchases or hotel purchases, travel purchases, things like that, because right now we don't have kids and we want to see the world as much as possible. Now, as life changes and when we eventually do have kids, travel is not really gonna be a priority for us. We're gonna be worried about and concerned with taking care of them and the household as a whole. So the credit card that we use at that point is probably gonna be some sort of cash back card because we're gonna be making a ton of purchases at the grocery store and things like that. We want as much money back as possible. And so you can see how as life evolves and as your relationship evolves, the need and the use of those credit cards will change. And you have to be able to adjust as well so that you can take advantage of the credit card and its benefits. It allows you to finance things without having to pay cash, but it requires a level of responsibility and trust that needs to be discussed with your partner. And the same for the joint bank account. That is an account that's getting money that both people have access to. Have the conversations beforehand, build up the trust, and then open those accounts to help further your lives. Now, one of the biggest things that we want to make sure we do when we're merging our finances is having regular reviews and conversations about our money. Are we doing what we discussed previously in this plan? Are we spending money in a way that aligns with our values and goals? Where is it? How much uh, are our expenditures? Are we paying off our credit card in a timely manner? Are we saving money and investing that and putting it to work for our future selves, right? Are we doing the things with our finances that are going to progress our lives and move us forward? And the only way you're going to figure that out is if you're doing regular reviews with your partner. Have those conversations to see if you're on track. Have those conversations to see if there are any issues that have arisen. Have those conversations to see if you both need to adjust to get back on course. Make sure you're having these regular conversations because that is the key to staying on track and getting to where you want to be. And as a last note, real quick, make sure you discuss things like name changes and last names because eventually if your partner decides to change their name or you decide to change your name to your partner's, that's going to require paperwork and that's gonna require an understanding of what needs to be done beforehand. So have those conversations beforehand. And on top of that, I would recommend having conversations about beneficiaries. Things like 401ks and IRAs require you to have a beneficiary listed if something were to happen to you. I personally right now, because I'm not married, have my sibling, my sister, as my beneficiary. And once I get married, that's going to change to my partner. Make sure that you're updating that, not only on retirement accounts, but any other accounts that require a beneficiary. That could be life insurance and some other ones as well. So I know we just went over a lot and I wanna give you some actionable takeaways that you can use with your partner. Remember to look at these things through the lens of time and understand that your finances and requirements and needs are gonna change as life changes and life happens. Be prepared to adjust and be prepared to make changes as they come up.
Don't forget to discuss expectations and responsibilities. Who is going to be managing the finances? Ideally, it's both of you. But if there's going to be one person that's kind of taking the lead, make sure the other person is also involved in the process and also has an understanding of what's going on and why. Income, how much money is coming in? How much are we making? And what are we going to be able to do with that money? Expenses, where is our money going? And does this align with our values and what we want to see happen in life? Saving and investing, hopefully you're making good money, you're spending less than you make, and there is a surplus available for you to put to work. What are you doing with that money to help you further your life along and to help you get closer to the goals that you set for yourselves? You have to think about your future self and you have to start planning and acting to put yourself in the best position to be successful. And discuss your work benefits, right? What are the best benefits for us? Make sure you're going through the list and make sure you understand what this means for you now and also in the future if you decide to have a family. Now, putting this into practice, set up a joint bank account for joint expenses. This also helps build a level of trust and decide how you want to split those expenses. 50-50 based on percentage, but make sure you're both on the same page about that. Credit cards. Again, these are a tool that you can use to help make payments on things, but also to help build up credit, help build up extra points and benefits that you can use for travel and cash back. Make sure you're both using it appropriately and responsibly. Make sure you both understand the expectations of having each other on the credit card and make sure you both understand how decisions are going to affect both of you. And lastly, make sure you're setting up regular financial reviews. Life changes, things come up. We need to be able to have time set aside to discuss this, how it affects us, and how it affects us going forward. Have these regular conversations so that you're both up to speed on what's going on and you're both involved in the process and you both have an awareness of what needs to be done and what's going on. Remember, you both are a team and a team that's going to be made stronger by having these important conversations and doing the work. Love and money do mix and can mix very well only if the proper foundation is laid. Do the work and reap the benefits of these important conversations. I hope you found this video valuable and you're finding this series, Love, Marriage, and Finances, valuable as well. If so, please give it a like so other people in YouTube can see it. And also, please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future videos. Thank you so much. Take care. I'll see you soon.